This is part three of a series on shorebird topography in which we'll be looking at the upper parts. In part one, we looked at the head and in part two, the underparts and the legs. And if you missed those videos or you'd like to review them, I'll put a link in the description below this video. Which brings us to the remaining part of the bird, which is visible when it's on the ground, the upper parts. The feather tracks on the upper parts are more challenging to identify than the head and the underparts, but it's worth the effort because it's these feathers which probably tell us the most about the bird, both, both in terms of its species and its age. And for this video, I've switched our model from the adult female Malaysian plover in the previous videos to this juvenile redneck stint. I've done this because, as you can see, the feathers on the upper parts of this bird stand out more clearly than on the plover. They're exactly the same feather groups as on all shorebirds, so that you can use what you learn from this bird and apply it to any shorebird. Zooming in then, here are the upper parts of a juvenile redneck stint. Working our way back from the head or the front of the bird, the first group of feathers is known as the mantle. This is a roughly triangular area of rather small feathers located at the base of the nape down to the back between the wings. On some species at certain ages, as on this bird, there's a pale brown, uh, a pale line down each side of the mantle, forming a V when you see it from above. The next group of feathers is one of the most important generally in shorebird identification. And these are the scapulars. They cover the join between the wing and the body of the bird. And the lower feathers especially are quite large. There are five rows of scapulars which can be divided into two subgroups, the upper three rows and the lower two rows. The scapulars function rather like an oriental fan. They can be held open or closed. When they are closed, as in this photograph, the lower rows are partially hidden or even fully hidden beneath the upper ones, so it can be hard to figure out where all the five rows are. When the scapulars are held closed, most of the wing coverts, the feathers immediately below the scapulars, can be clearly seen, as on this photograph. However, when the scapulars are held open, you can see that they cover a much larger area and they hide most of the wing coverts completely. Now that they are open, it's much easier to see the individual rows of feathers. So the three upper rows and the two lower ones. We can see that the lower scapulars are significantly larger than the upper ones. And in this case, we can see that the two groups are also differently patterned. If you can cast your mind back to part two of this series, You'll also see that in this photograph, the four flank feathers are covering the leading edge of the wing. Whereas on the previous one, they are underneath the wing. So depending on how an individual bird is holding its scapulars and its flank feathers, this will determine how much of the wing we can see. Now we're going to move out onto the wing itself, but before we look at feather groups, I want to try to show you how the wing is put together. Think back to the last time you ate chicken wings. The flesh and bone of the wing is more or less an S shape, and this is what the wing feathers are all connected to and grow out of. And just like the human arm, there is an upper arm, a, a forearm, and the last, the outermost part is the hand, although the feathers are, sorry, the bones are fused together so you can't see individual fingers. So the feathers of the outer wing, made up of usually 10 primaries, grow out of the bird's hand, the outermost bony part. Next to them are the secondaries, and they grow out of the equivalent of the forearm. Uh, and on the folded wing, they lie on top of the primaries. And then closest to the body are a small group of feathers called tertials. 
and together the primaries, secondaries and tertials are known as the flight feathers. The next group of feathers are the coverts and as you can see they cover virtually all of the flight feathers when the bird is not flying. The job of these feathers, other than regulating temperature and keeping the body from being waterlogged, is to protect the all-important flight feathers from damage caused by the elements. These feathers, therefore, are among the most susceptible to wear and tear during the course of a bird's uh, arduous lifestyle, its migration, migratory journeys and its time uh, on the wintering grounds or on the breeding grounds. And then finally, the scapulars, which we've already covered, um, and they cover many of the coverts, especially the uh, smaller coverts, the marginal coverts and the lesser coverts. So now we can hopefully understand a little better um, what we're looking at on the wing, which bits we can see and which bits we can't. The area or the, the area of feathers below the scapulars are collectively known as the coverts. You might also hear them referred to as the secondary coverts or the upper wing coverts or the wing coverts. But essentially, if we talk about the coverts, this is usually the area, the group of feathers that we're referring to. Starting from the leading edge of the wing, the very smallest feathers are the marginal coverts. These are usually partially or even fully hidden on a perch bird. Next are the lesser coverts, and there are several rows of these. Going up in size, there is the median coverts. There's only one row of those. And then the largest of all the secondary coverts are the greater coverts. Normally on a perch bird, we can only see some of the inner greater coverts. The outer ones are hidden beneath the median coverts. Behind the coverts, lie the tertials. There are three or four of these. They are long, narrow feathers and they are the innermost flight feathers, the ones closest to the body. Next to these are the secondaries. And there are usually ten of these, but they're almost completely hidden beneath the greater coverts when the bird is on the ground. And this explains why a bird like a common redshank may appear to have entirely brown upper parts when it's on the mud, but when it flies, suddenly we can see a large white patch on the wing. The white is on the secondaries, so it's completely concealed on a bird that has its wings closed. Lastly, on the wing, the primaries. These are normally, uh, there are normally 10 of these, and they're mostly black or very dark brown or dark gray. And then finally, the tail. Most shorebirds have six pairs of tail feathers. Snipes have more. And the tail is often concealed partly or entirely by the primaries as they lie on top of it. And this can lead uh, for inexperienced observers to, to the mistake of saying, oh, the bird has a black tail. Whereas in fact, what we're looking at is the primaries that are sitting on top of the tail. We've now covered the entire bird while it's not flying. However, there are parts of the bird which we still haven't seen, which we can only see when the bird opens its wings and starts to fly. So in the next video, we'll look at the topography of a flying bird.